everywhere that everyone can share. Telly, telly on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? For half a century, girls have dreamt of the fairy tale chance to be crowned the most beautiful girl in the world. We search for beauty gain. Will the mascara run? Will the judges run when faced with yet another national costume? Tonight, we draw back the curtain and take a look at what really goes on backstage. Unlike the girls, it isn't always pretty. Find out what happened to the winners once the crown and sometimes the dress size slipped. Dazzling us tonight, Leslie Langley. She's a blonde, her eyes are blue and she's a model. Nearly 40 years ago, she took her first tentative steps on the Miss World catwalk. I entered Miss World more as something that just happened to me in life. I never planned it. The more I see you, the more I want you. I won the heat for the Miss United Kingdom. So it just sort of snowballed and I ended up having to go in for the Miss World contest. I, I never would have planned to do anything like that. I never had the ambitions really to be a beauty queen. In 1977, ABBA ruled the charts and fellow Swede 20-year-old student Mary Stavin was the winner taking it all. The more I see you, as years go by, First of all, I was planning that maybe I shouldn't even be in it. I thought, well, I get a free trip to go to England for a few weeks. It was a different world for me. I'd come out of school. I was living with my parents, you know. I was a young girl from Sweden. And my heart won't try. I felt it was embarrassing me being there, especially when you see all the girls arriving, like Miss America with her eight suitcases. And it was quite intimidating to be a part of it. It's the law to describe any girl from South America as a Latin lovely. So this Latin lovely was the toast of the 1975 show. Miss Puerto Rico is Wilnelia Merced, just 18. It was the first time I was leaving my island, so it was the first time I was traveling, and especially to go so far away. What I really wanted, it was to be in the last 15 finals. That was my dream. Um, so becoming Miss World, it was like, Really, it was like a dream come through. Miss United States of America. The diamonds weren't even real, but these girls wanted the prize bad. And each year, 30 million of us tuned in to watch them scream. <laughs> Miss Guam, Kim Santos, went from armchair viewer to Miss World 1980. My father, we'd always sit and watch the show, and every year he would pick the girl that eventually won. And he kept telling me, you know, you should do it, you should do it. And I thought, well, you know, okay, why not? Just, I'll, I'll have a go. In 1966, judges marveled at India's Rita Faria. She didn't just have a head for facts, she had a pretty smart figure too. I entered the Miss World competition as a joke. It was the first time India was sending an entry to the Miss World. And I was a final year medical student and we thought as students this was the last frivolous act we could do before qualifying as doctors. Miss United Kingdom's Helen Morgan was a valley girl who rose to stardom and was hot favorite in 1974. I was working in Wales doing modeling and the model agency phoned up to see if I could make up the numbers for the Miss Wales that year. They were four girls short. Well, the applause was going as soon as you appeared at the top of the steps. And as the Miss Wales, you go on to do Miss Universe, Miss UK, and if you win all those, you go on to Miss World. From the land of reggae and relaxation, the final contestant in tonight's lineup. Cynthia Jean Breakspear, Miss Jamaica. I was young, out of high school. And it just seemed to be the thing I could do that would make me the most money. I'd see the world in style and hopefully have a good time doing it. But not too good. No, you come. You all here? Keeping a watchful eye was the power behind the throne, Eric Morley, Miss World's creator. Watch me. Columbia, he's very good looking, nice man, but he's not going to tell you what to do. They're really only kids at heart, and here they've got Mum, Mrs. World herself, to help boost morale. 
The contest was owned by Mecca Ballrooms, but became a family affair, with Eric's wife, Julia, acting fairy godmother. Together, they created a magical formula. When Eric um, started this in 51, the idea was it was some, a one-off exercise for the Festival of Britain. They were all in bikinis, and uh, everyone went mad, the press went mad, and it was so successful. The company decided to continue on and use it as a public relations exercise. Flesh is still being flashed. Sun City, South Africa is playing host to the most recent Miss World contest. The boys watch the girls while the girls watch the boys who watch the girls. Go and with all these hormones and high heels, the rules need to be strict. Following Eric's recent death, it's up to Julia to make sure these girls play fair. The rules are very simple, I guess. Usually a girl between the ages of 17 and 25 enters. Uh, usually it's someone unmarried or <laughs> until you find they're not, you know. Uh, things like that. Can't have six children, etc. But the very serious part is mostly the students who, who want to mix with other students worldwide. They're following in the stilettos of a bevy of past beauties, chaperoned wherever they go. Beauty and boyfriends don't mix. We were pretty well looked after during the actual two weeks of the contest. So we were shepherded about from place to place. We weren't allowed out on anywhere on our own. Come on, Marla, where's your badge? The good shepherds whose job it is to harry the flock into the right place at the right time, looking happy about it. Even though I lived in the town, this is my town anyway in London, and they have to look after all these girls. It's quite a responsibility, really, I suppose, for the organisation. We all had to stay on one floor of a hotel. There were bodyguards sort of on the exits. You couldn't get out and nobody could get in. They were quite strict. You couldn't sort of escape all that. Dances here have tended to be a somewhat feminine affair. It's a shame, really. All this untouchable beauty, with an average age of 18, having to dance with itself. We would have our own lift so that we could only go to those floors and nobody else could, you know, take a lift to our floors. We used to turn all the music on and everybody would dance out in the halls and things like that. As the girls showed their form, the bookies had a field day. Now, the betting that goes on, or used to go on with the bookmakers, was tremendous. There'd be as much money on the Miss World as there was for the Derby. You could sit around as well as a family and betting each other. Oh, well, I think, uh, I think um, Miss um, so-and-so, she's better than Miss Watsit. For me, it was very strange uh, when uh, my chaperone was trying to explain me about this betting, because in my country, you only bet on horses. You'd never think about doing anything else. All the girls would be introduced to the press in swimwear. They always used to do that, like maybe about three days before the final night. And that was when my odds really went right down. Other hopefuls found that their love affair with the camera was, well, one-sided. Being a 66 to 1 outsider and only having 66 entrants in that year, I was definitely left out of the publicity shots. Hey, little girl. Comb your hair, fix your makeup, soon he will open the door. The girls would stop at nothing to make themselves beautiful. They had their own tricks of the trade, piles of them. It's quite interesting hearing beauty secrets from around the world. I think the, the popular one then was the um, that using hemorrhoid cream would shrink spots, you know, and so we're all sending out for hemorrhoid cream. We'd spend nights putting night tan all over because it's November. So we had to get some tan going here and then we put the baby oil on, get all nice and shiny <laughs> to clean up the makeup. I had a white bathing suit when I left Puerto Rico and um, when I saw all the other girls during the rehearsal, I called my mother and I said, Mommy, you know, everybody's wearing a white bathing suit. I might have like an elastic here, so I used to kind of press my breasts. We went shopping for one and I saw this zebra, exactly like this chair, bathing suit, miles away. And I said to, to my friend, if I could see that bathing suit from here, I'm sure they would be able to see me from, you know, the judge from so far away. The national costume round was designed to make even the most patriotic hand in their passports. Here's a representative of Smurfland and the girl from Poodle Bay. In the case of Grenada, which is a small island, um, tourism is a major, major factor. So for me to wear the national costume and have an opportunity to talk about it meant a lot to them. When hearts are passing
Mine was really quite a super, a superbly made costume. I was a nutmeg princess in it. And you had these, these beautiful copper leaves and, and the nutmeg in the front. Looking back at my national costume, I thought it was fantastic. It was just so glamorous, really, wasn't it? I thought it was quite flattering. I remember the Welsh costume had a, a big black hat. Well, compared to the, some of the other countries, it wasn't too bad. <laughs> I think they wanted coconut bra and um, fruit basket on the head or something, and I thought, no, I can't do that. I can't. In national costume time, it was wicked. When one country decided to dress the girl as a chicken, I thought that's when we should stop. <laughs> but it was fun. And, and you had to laugh with people. I, was, I wasn't laughing at anyone. I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. I'd like to hold it in my arms and keep it company. We had to sing a song and, you know, kind of sway back and forth. I mean, now they have them doing these incredible dance routines and everything, and I'm thinking, God, I'm so glad. I wasn't me, because I couldn't have done it. They wanted to teach the world to sing, but someone had to teach them to sing first. We all had a sheet of paper and we learned how to sing. Um, I'd l I think it was, I'd like to teach the world to sing or something, and uh, kind of swayed to that, and all mouthing the wrong things because, you know, half the girls didn't speak English. I'd like to teach the world to sing. Coming up next, the girls bear all in the swimsuit round, and one winner reveals why she was crowned minus her underwear. One hundred apprehensive girls are taking to the stage in the current Miss World contest. They've been whittled down from thousands. Tall and tan and young and lovely, the girl from Ipanema goes walking, and when she passes, each one she passes goes. Oh. When she walks, she's like a samba that swings so cool and sways so gentle that. When she passes These days they dress to impress, but once upon a time they received a lot more exposure. And the ladies just take one more walk around in front of the judges for the final inspection. Thank you. Ah yes, a thong for Europe, the legendary swimsuit round. The contestants all lined up on stage together and they'd make you stand there and smile at the judges and then they'd ask you to turn to your right and then turn all the way round and then turn back again, and that was the swimsuit round. Turn. As Eric telling us, turn, 
turn, so the judges can judge us from every angle. You could almost say it for me. Turn. They only work to the word of command of a man. And it actually, it makes me cringe. It really is. It's so weird. I can never do that again. Let's have another view. And again, thank you. Obviously, they can't be ogling at all 66 at the same time. They're obviously trying their best to decide uh, who they think uh, fits in best into the swimsuit, I guess. You know, all of us girls holding our tummies in and back straight and whatnot. I think it's at the time, perhaps, it was a little bit degrading. It is a little bit not PC, is it, nowadays? But then it didn't seem to matter quite so much. Five feet, eight inches tall, and that tasty figure measures 36, 24, 36. 36, 24, 36. 36, 24, 36. Forget E equals MC squared. 36, 24, 36 was the winning formula of the beauty world. Blokes brushed up on their maths, and the girls themselves did a bit of figure massaging. The vital statistics. I don't remember anybody ever putting a tape measure around me and measuring me. Um, I just gave my vital statistics. <laughs> oh, there's no measuring going on beforehand. You tell them what you are. So I guess I should have added a couple of inches and took away a couple of inches. <laughs> it sounds a little braggy, but I was thinking my body is better now than it was in my bathing suit then. <laughs> But most revealing of all was the prehistoric attitudes of the average British TV host back then. This United Kingdom is Leslie Langley. Leslie, whereabouts in the old country are you from? Well, I come from the south coast in Dorset, Weymouth. Tiny little seaside town. It was rather unnatural being in a swimsuit, talking to Michael Aspel all dressed. It was a, an, an odd experience. It's, it's really quite weird, the whole thing. And I think I look so weird. Hair, unbelievable. Talk about fluffy. My daughter always calls me fluffy, I see why now. Do you think this country is in a state of moral decline and plunging towards Armageddon? Or are you a firm believer in the <laughs> indomitable spirit of man and the innate dignity of the species? <laughs> Would you repeat that? No, <laughs> and most Canadian fellows, are they big lads? I've got the same as anywhere else, I guess. That was a daft question, I'm sorry. Do you think the great resources of your country will ever become exhausted? Well, I don't know. Well, ask a silly question, get a silly answer, I guess. <laughs> of course, not everyone in the world has Michael Aspel's devastating command of the language. The real toe-curling moment came for those poor non-English-speaking girls. But as Miss, if you were Miss World, you would travel, wouldn't you? Oh, no. I want to study languages before the contest. You want to study languages before? Yes, yes. It's a bit late now. Would you like to uh, have an English lesson? Lesson? Well, yes, I mean, you just repeat after me whatever I say. OK. You want to try it? Right. Will. Will. You. You. Come. Come. To. to my. My. Room. Room. After. <laughs> yes, I will. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'll try and get this right. Will Nelia Merced? Will Nelia Merced. Merced, we're almost right, actually, who speaks uh, a little bit of English. A little bit of English. A little bit of English. Yeah. I was a little bit nervous when it came to the host, but I couldn't really understand what he was saying. Have you had a lot of fun, or is it all hard work? Oh. A little bit of English. Yes, a little bit of English. <laughs> we're back where we started. Probably should have somebody to translate. Uh, but everybody laugh and I thought I probably blew the whole thing now. So if it's not brain size or bra size, just what is the secret ingredient that makes one girl stand out? What is a star? You know, somebody who walks into a room or walks on the stage and as soon as you see them, you're with them straight away. Uh, it's, it's, it's a certain little magic that some people have. You know, you'd look at one of them more than, say, the other two just by the way she walked. And then maybe when she started to talk, it wouldn't be as good. I'm not really nervous, actually. I don't know. We'll see. So, no major world issues, you know. How do you feel about genetic engineering? Oh. You know? <laughs> 
I wouldn't know. What you want to find out, first of all, is about them personally. Let them explain who they are, uh, rather than sort of saying, well, what will you do if you're Miss World? And they come out with the usual cliches. I really want to help children because I think that that's the most important age, uh, the most important part of life. You have a very noble ambition. What is that? Well, to help the emotionally handicapped people, I feel like by the giving of myself, I can help others to feel better about themselves. Not to gain glory from the public, but to gain glory from God above. I'd like to send all my love to the children of the world. I think just to um, maybe travel a bit. I would love to go on a tour, a world tour to promote our peace. And if anybody says, by the way, that there are just as good-looking girls in their street, please send the address of your street to Michael Aspel, BBC Television Centre. But the world's most glamorous cattle market was heading for trouble. Feminists began targeting the contest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I am very, very happy to be here at this cattle market tonight. <laughs> Moo. No, it's quite a cattle market. I've been back there checking calves. <laughs> no, but this is beautiful, and I'm very thrilled to be here. In 1970, the normally unflappable Bob Hope came under a hail of home pride at the Albert Hall. Feminist flower bombs proved a real showstopper. I... It was realized, though, by the organizers that there has been some criticism before this began. There were threats made earlier in the week to disrupt the contest. Well, as far as the protesters go and, and the idea that we're being exploited and used, I was exploiting myself. Nobody sent me there. I wanted to go. And I did everything in my power to get there. I didn't sleep with anybody to get there. I didn't belittle myself. I never felt that I did. Some people can sing, some people can dance, some of us are good looking. We all use our talents in different ways. Exploitation of shame on you! People like to say, you know, because you go through something like that, you know, you don't have much going for you, or you're stupid, or you're not qualified for whatever. We aren't qualified. This is just a fun thing. I had a lot of discussions with feminists and all these people, you know, putting me down all the time. But I was saying to them, well, what have you done? You know, at least, so I, I, I was stomping around in a bathing suit. Oh, yeah, it's not my favorite thing to do. But I was a young girl. I had fun uh, doing it. I, 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 I've seen the world. I've learned a lot. The best education of my life was that year, actually. If nothing else, you learned how to count backwards. Always a handy skill, especially for the catchphrase of the show. I shall now announce the results in reverse order. I shall announce the results in reverse order. You shall announce the results in reverse order. And you hear the immortal lines, and in reverse order, there's Eric's voice. <laughs> Behind the scenes was the most tense time of the whole contest. So everybody was there smoking with the stress and tension of it all. Just waiting is the most excruciating part. That was horrible. I didn't enjoy that at all. Now a young lady who receives a cheque for £2,500 a screen test by Columbia Pictures, Miss World 1965. And then my name's called... Miss United Kingdom. You really don't know until he says it, which one of you it will be. It actually looks like I was hyperventilating. It looks like my chest was heaving. And Miss World 1976... I mean, I just threw my head back and screamed. It's Miss Jamaica. <laughs> And the Royal Albert Hall is in uproar. Incredible, Cindy Breakspear, the 21-year-old health club operator, gets the sash. I think she's as overwhelmed as anyone. It was like, a, you know, when a film goes through your mind. At Miss World 1975. My whole life went through my head. It's a very strange feeling. It's Miss Puerto Rico. In Incredible sensation here at the Albert Hall. Suddenly, there I am, crowned Miss World. So 
I felt like a Cinderella that evening, you know, having a crown on my head. Here's the great moment for Wilnelia Merced of Puerto Rico. It's like a little girl fairy tale kind of thing, isn't it? Which I had never dreamt about. And Miss World 1977 is Miss Sweden. What a sensation. That's Mary Ann Katrine Stavine. 20-year-old student of physical training from uh, a town called Erebro. Obviously totally stunned by the whole uh, occasion. The crown's plonked on the incredible hair, the sash goes over, and you have to walk up and down doing a little lap of honour. Out it came, the little tear. <laughs> I was in such shock, I just couldn't believe it. I, I literally was, was, I think I cried for three days, actually. It sounds ridiculous. <laughs> and then people are going, ah, oh, here's another one crying and all that. You're trying to balance the crown on your head and you can barely manage that with a cloak and a crown and a scepter. And one feels rather pretentious, you know, that you've suddenly been crowned. Well, it was really very hectic backstage and uh, you barely had time to get your gown back on because we switched from swimwear to be crowned in evening gown. And I actually went out and took my final walk minus my underwear. I mean, you had to have the shoes on and you had to have the gown on, so you kind of left for the last what nobody would know wasn't there. And I made my final walk minus my underwear. There was just no time to put it on. Cindy. The morning after the night before, a year of glitz and glamour awaited, and opening supermarkets in Workington. And like that crown, it went straight to some of their heads. The first thing happens is they bring you a t-shirt with your face on it, with the crown, and you put that on, and you sit up in bed and have breakfast and your coffee, and they interview you, take pictures while you're doing this. So it starts immediately. <laughs> My mother had sent me out with this long sleeve, high neck, flannel nighty, and <laughs> she thought England was cold, you see. So anyway, I have this breakfast in bed with my crown on my, my head, and in the nighty, getting my breakfast in bed. Cindy, one big one up here. English people love their Miss World, that's for sure. You know, you'd like, especially at the, the um, bingo halls and the social clubs. It's just the same. <laughs> you'd have elderly ladies there who've been following the history of Miss World for 20 odd years. They've got their little autograph books and they've got every signature coming up over the years. And yet, there would be others who would look, up, look you up and down. I heard one say one day, Oh, I wouldn't give you a tuppence for her. <laughs> girls, 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 girls. Well, they made them up in Hollywood. We probably were the supermodels of the day because we had the glamour, we, would, we were always in the public eye, we were always in the press. At the ball, a Volvo came up to me and they gave me a car and, you know, would you like a Volvo? Yeah, right. <laughs> you just don't believe things like that are going to happen. That's very glamorous. You know, all of a sudden, the week before you couldn't afford to buy the dress you wanted, after you win, all the companies are wanting to give you dresses and the fur coat and the this, you know. I get an apartment in Hyde Park Square. It, it, it's just uh, beyond your wildest imagination. Shy girl, sexy girl, hell like that fancy world. Champagne, a gentle song and a slow dance. Oh, my life changed uh, dramatic. I was just a girl from my town who's never been out of Puerto Rico, um, just going to school. And suddenly, you know, 
it was like a big celebrity. Everybody wanted to know how I sleep, how I eat, you know, who I go out with. I have to meet so many people and travel so much and sometimes you didn't feel like smiling. You just wanted to stay in the hotel, no makeup, have a you know, room service and go to sleep. And that's what I used to do uh, when I was free. I think I used to sleep for hours and hours and call home. This self-possessed air hostess paraded the island's name before millions who until then had thought it was an old Spanish town or maybe an old Manchester television company. Shortly after winning, I went back to Grenada and they declared a public holiday. A postage stamp was struck. And the island was, um, the kids got holiday from school and greeted me in the, in the streets. And it was, uh, I suppose, the same way as royalty would feel, you know, visiting a, a country. And it was, it was wonderful. It really meant so very much to them. And so I saw myself somewhat as a role model for many of these kids and, and as an ambassadress for, for the country. I went with Bob Hope to Vietnam for, on his Christmas tour, which he did each year with previous Miss Worlds before me as well. We were each given um, a designation in case we were captured, and I was general. Furia at the time. The whole experience of performing for tens of thousands of troops that were uh, in in a war si situation, it was a very moving experience, really. But as well as global politics, Miss World thrived on scandal. And in 1965, Leslie Langley's saucy past caught up with her. When I was just a little girl, I asked my mother, what will I be? Yes, it was a little bit of scandal for me that year, as they often was with the girls. And my bit was that I'd done some nude photos in my modeling days before the Miss World was just to me another job. But of course, winning Miss World, that wasn't good in those days. The future's not ours to see. Que sera, sera. So I think there was talk about me maybe being disqualified, but it never happened. In 1974, the fairy tale turned sour for Miss UK Helen Morgan. She resigned after just four days amidst a tabloid frenzy when they realised she was a single mum. The sort of angles that the newspaper would take Miss World, unmarried mother, Miss World, cited in a divorce case. OK, I, I had a child, but, you know, I wasn't the only person to have done that. I wasn't the only woman to ever have had a child before they were married. A lot of the Catholic countries were complaining that I'd been allowed to win or take part even, being an unmarried mother. And their girls were all whiter than white. In fact, they were probably virgins. Dreams are for those A year earlier, American Marjorie Wallace was forced to hand back the crown after unbecoming behavior. She denied rumors that she wanted to sleep with as many men as possible. This tight-trousered Welsh Lothario was just one of them. I'd like to make it with me. There were wave after wave of abdications. In 1980, Germany's Gabriella Brum quit after only 24 hours. What a difference a day made. It was rumored that she'd given her all for the cameras once before in a porn film. 24 little hours. Runner up Miss Guam, Kim Santos, was waiting in the wings. The sun and the flower. I had a wonderful crowning because it was actually the first time a girl had been crowned outside of London. We had a huge stage down on the beach, and I came to the stage on this flotilla of boats, and, and the, the whole island was there. It was just wonderful. In 1976, Miss Jamaica Cindy Breakspear had it all a Miss World crown and a child with the king of reggae. But for some, one love was one love too many. 
At the time, I was involved with the late, great Bob Marley. It attracted a great deal of publicity, needless to say, because in those days, young women from a upper middle class background in Jamaica certainly were not getting involved with Rastafarians. I know he got a great deal of flack because I guess you could say I really was the antithesis of what he should have been looking for in a woman because in those days the emphasis was on modesty. You must wear long skirts, tie up your head, no makeup, all about naturalness and this type of thing. But he was also a competitive person and a very ambitious person. And I think it's also true to say that most men, no matter what their persuasions are, would like to have the pretty girl. <laughs> it's a bottom line. The bottom line was certainly what attracted this man, who became as much a part of the prize as the crown itself. George Best and Mary Stavin were the posh and becks of their day. My relationship with George Best was, uh, well, it was a relationship. It was based on the right reasons to begin with. And then we made this exercise video, which I was into all that stuff. And I guess he was at times too, exercising and all that, and health. And it was just a natural at the time. But their relationship wasn't always as healthy as their exercise routine. It was quite annoying at times when things were exposed, but that was our own fault and to a certain degree, you know, problems with alcohol and all that were not for me, but obviously he's got a problem or had a problem with that. And they, you know, that became public first page stories. One story about their relationship has made it into showbiz folklore, but according to Mary, it never happened. Don't ask George for confirmation. He was there in body and very definitely in spirits. I was with a young lady who was, it was uh, Miss World, uh, Mary Stavin, and we'd gone out for the night and uh, gone off to the casino and I'd, I'd won a fortune, I'd, it was something like £25,000. Apparently, George Best and I were in a hotel room. I'd thrown the 25000 on a four-poster bed and Mary had gone in the bathroom and come out in a see-through negligee. I'm supposed to be in this, like, negligee, which I don't think I ever would wear. And the little porter staggered in with a bottle of Dom Perignon. He's turned around, had another look at the bottle of Dom Perignon, the £25,000 in the bed. Apparently the waiter looks at George and he says... Where the hell did it all go wrong? <laughs> it's supposed to be really funny, I guess. I, I don't really get it. But anyway, I wasn't there. <laughs> but it's, I guess it's a cute story. But I definitely wasn't there. I, I've never gone through this experience. Not even in my dreams. Be a good girl, would you, and uh, put her on automatic? After being a best girl, the next step was to be a Bond girl, licensed to thrill. We uh, could do with a couple of glasses. They're in the overhead rack. Oh, Commander Bond. Call me James. It's five days to Alaska. <laughs> Back in the 1960s, jazz was cool and Leslie Langley pulled out all the stops with top organist Alan Haven. He was going to do something with tunes from around the world or something. He thought it might be a nice idea to have Miss World on the cover. So he rang me and that's how I, I started a relationship with Alan, who was one of the biggest jazz organists at the time. He was the biggest in this country, actually, in the 60s. And we had a great time, and we travelled the world and did various gigs. And I added a bit of glamour to the group for a while, playing my percussion toys, which I enjoyed. I didn't mind being tagged as Miss World. It was quite nice. We actually quite cashed in on it, and we made use of it if we, if we needed to. It was quite good. We promoted our, our music business with it. So it didn't matter. I used it for my own ends. Was that a freeze? You make me feel so young. Miss Puerto Rico had a fairy tale ending with her own Prince Charming from the judges panel. She became Mrs. Bruce Forsyth. Bruce is a gentleman. He knows how to treat a lady. Uh, he's a man of details and um, he's very romantic. 
we go to a place um, where we're not very well known, probably even, even here, checking into this hotel, people would immediately see her, you know. Men always, as soon as they, they go, that's it, and they've got the stare on. And then afterwards they see me, sort of by the side of her, walking behind her, and they say, well, who is he? Who is he? Is, is he your manager? You know, is he your agent? Is he your coach? Who is he? And then it'll suddenly dawn on them that this silly old fool is, uh, is her husband. Hope you have a lovely couple of days. We can't all give Bruce a twirl, so what happened to the other girls? Find out after the break. Could she? She could win it again. Yes. I don't know if you have a word with the other judges. But cheers, man. As Miss Nigeria becomes the latest girl to be crowned Miss World, a year in the limelight beckons. But what happened to our winners when it was Tara to the tiara and the lights and the looks began to fade? Hey, did you happen to see the most beautiful girl in the world? I think Joan Collins summed it up when she said, being beautiful and getting older is like being rich and getting poor. If you happen to see the most beautiful girl who walked out on me I think it is difficult growing older and trying to be what people think you are or what you were. People do still expect you to look good and look like you did almost, you know, all those years ago. Hey, did you happen to see the most beautiful girl in the world? To this day, I still get people to come up to me in, in a shopping mall or wherever to say that they've always wanted to have a good look at me, and, and they do, right up and down with absolutely no compunction. They thought I was taller, they thought I was something that I'm not. And just very curious to, to speak with you and, and see what you look like up front and personal. I think the strain of getting older once you've been in the glamour business is difficult. You're watching every line, every bag under the eye, and the strain of that is too much for me to keep on wanting to be in showbiz. It's not the kind of life I could possibly sustain. Leslie Langley's still in the eyes and teeth business. These days she's a dental receptionist. At the moment I'm working in a lovely private dental surgery in Weymouth three days a week, which suits me beautifully. I have so many patients coming to the surgery, so they know me and they like it. You know, it's quite a novelty value, isn't it, having a Miss World there? Kim Santos walked away from the limelight to star in a different kind of parade. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Miss Squall 1980, Kimberly Santos. I didn't miss the glamour part of it at all. I mean, often I can remember we'd be in a, in a limousine going to somewhere and we'd have, like, police outriders. And I can remember sitting, thinking, looking at them, thinking, God, I'd really like to be one of them. I wanted to do voluntary work and I thought, oh, what could I do? And I decided to become a special constable in the Metropolitan Police. And it was fantastic. I loved it. I'm not doing it now, but I did it for four years. One bacon, Bertie. There you are. Thanks a lot. And after years of wolf whistles from building sites, Kim's decided if you can't beat them, join them. Now, actually, I'm working as a builder. It was a quite a change from being a beauty queen, worrying about your makeup, worrying about your hair, your clothes, and things like that. I, actually, I find it a great release, not having to think about those things. It's wonderful being able to roll out of bed, put on your overalls, no makeup, have a bacon sandwich on the way to work. 
I've always liked the idea of living in two worlds. You know, I can do that during the day. If I if I have to get dressed up at night, and that's fun too, once in a while, to be a girl. But I prefer being a builder. Thirty years ago, Cindy Breakspear was toasting her relationship with the King of Reggae. These days, she's been bitten by the music bug. Well, I'm currently involved in two things now. I do freelance interior design. Love home, passionate about that. Just love it. I mean, don't invite me to your house or I'll start rearranging it the minute I'm through the door. And I'm involved in the music business. I've been doing that for some years now. You never find the words to say the way I feel. I released, what is it now, five singles to date. Uh, the first one, an original, called Midlife Crisis, which I thought was absolutely brilliant, was a dismal flop in Jamaica. And the more things change, they stay the same. I'm about to embark on an album with my current husband, who's a wonderful musician, plays guitar. So we're going to collaborate on that. Miss World 1977, Miss Sweet. The Miss World opened a lot of doors for me. People say, oh, you know, did it change your life? My life hadn't really started then. It was, uh, I was a kid, I was going to school, I was living with my parents. It took me a, a different direction. Mary Stavin has traded in life in the glamour business for life in the slow lane. I am very proud to say I have the most gorgeous daughter and um, she is the biggest part of my life. And of course my husband has something to do with it too. He's English and we live in New York and um, I've been taking care of her. I didn't want to be a mother that spits them out and mail them off. I want to be a mother and that's what I've been doing. Last year, she was voted the most beautiful girl in the world. This year, she's back at work, studying to become a doctor. After my Miss World year, I went back to medical school in London and qualified from London. That's where I met my husband. We met in 1967 and have been together ever since. Rita's time as Miss World gave her a great bedside manner, which she put to good use working as a doctor in America. She gave it all up to raise a family, and these days she is looking after the latest addition. I have recently become a grandmother, which I'm very delighted with. It's wonderful for both David and myself to be grandparents now. Look forward to the next generation. And what of Helen Morgan? Back in the 70s, her single mother status was a scandal. Now her little boy is 28, and Helen has emigrated to Spain. Jennifer Hostin is the latest in a long line to put paid to the myth that beauty queens are bimbos. These days she's a diplomat for the Canadian government. I work in international development, and I currently work on the Pakistan and Afghanistan desk. Um, where um, it, of course, is extremely busy after September 11th as we look after the whole refugee situation that um, is emerging, has, has emerged. It has been with us for a while. I think the world attention to it has um, only been um, recently there, but it's been an issue that I've been part of and we've been working with for a long time. It's easy to be cynical about promoting world peace and saving children, but the truth is, the Miss World organization has raised millions of pounds for children's charities. Wilnelia is a true convert to the cause. She runs her own charity in Puerto Rico. Being a celebrity, it's so easy for me to get the telephone and ask for help. I've always been embarrassed about doing something like that, but when you do it for other people, especially for children, it is the most gratifying experience for me, and I feel like my life have, uh, is more meaningful now, and it's all thanks to being Miss World. I married Bruce, I'm a very happy, very lucky girl, and it's all that because of Miss World. But did all of our fairy tale princesses live happily ever after? Overall, I think it was a bit of a negative effect on my life. 
No matter what you do, you can never get rid of that label. Never ever. You will always be known as an ex Miss World. It's a strange thing, but once you are a Miss World, it, it's true, you are always. I think I'm going to be forever. I'm going to be dragged out when I'm 80, maybe in a wheelchair, because always there is interest. It opened up a new world to me, and it basically said, you can do anything you like. Maybe people will say, well, you know, you didn't take advantage of those options, and I probably didn't, not as much as maybe some of the other girls, but I've had a wonderful time, I've had a wonderful life. I cannot imagine living without the title of Miss World. It's been almost half my life. It is a standard that was set that I have tried to live up to in many different ways, not just the way you look, but the way you behave. It's a wonderful standard to have to live up to, contrary to its detractors. If I had my life to live over, the Miss World experience is something that I would want to have in there. It's a keeper.